Okay. So I, I wanted to share some photographs of my work that is basically has to do how humans use uh, space. And uh, normally I show it very fast, but today I show it even faster. So I will show you the first two image per second, which is almost the limit of perception. But uh, so maybe we can put the, the computer on. OK, so we switch from four to two. OK, so you will be disturbed. And normally um, most of the public is disturbed by this, but uh, just that you get a glimpse. So it will be so fast that I will not probably be able to speak and explain you. Uh, the, the pictures are now taken from an installation that is called Phenotypes Limited Forms. It's a machine developed with the students of the HFK Karlsruhe where there are 1,000 pictures from my archive and the public has this uh, wall where the 1,000 pictures are and can compose and uh, do a known book, a known composition. This is now in the Sao Paulo Biennale. Each picture has a rough idea on the back, and you put them on a table, and then the table recognizes which picture uh, are done. Here is in uh, Admont, it's a library in uh, a Baroque library in Austria. And uh, yeah, this idea of a growing uh, archive, but also something that, that changes shapes. Uh, this is the Regia di Caserta in Italy, the House of Wittgenstein in Austria and uh, a party in an official in the Regia di Caserta, a military uh, club. Uh, this is some Luna Park events, a spring factory in Italy, a friend, an artist. This is a Utopia station in Venice where I presented this idea of archive. It, basically, the first I presented, this is the office of Peter Weibel in Zaken. Uh and this is a substance 99% air at NASA Museum, Stockhausen is his wood, and a hovercraft going to... Uh, okay, this was a project to make a parallel Nile to the real Nile, 12 years ago, closed, Karashiva. This is a nuclear power station in... Uh, and there's a kindergarten inside this nuclear power station, the Ski Dome in Tokyo, now it's an IKEA. This is the flower market here in Amsterdam, a great place, center of symbolic, center of globalization. Ertan Dam, this is a series on uh, water dams in China. This, this is the Three Gorges Water Dam and the construction of this huge uh, elevator for ships that in the meantime is finished. Uh, uh, Fisher near the water dam, and these are kind of karaoke club where you can get different kind of services around the water dams. This is a house of an engineer. And here didn't ask if I could photograph some agricultural. This is Paula Pivi making a, a Krapfen sculpture flying to China and uh, the North Sea. Uh, here, the inside of the Mir replica. Uh, so some cosmodrome experiments in Russia. Uh, the first stuffed dog that went to the space. Uh, here we are in Brasilia and some other religious museum and Oscar Niemeyer. Um, Afghanistan between Pakistan, accident between Pakistan and Afghanistan, a poster for the nuclear engineers of Pakistan and uh, construction again of a water dam. So the idea was to, to uh, I had this idea to bring this about 12 years ago, to bring this archive on the internet that people could do a book and then the reverse idea was to instead of bringing things to the internet, bring it back to a physical space. This is the Bacardi uh, uh, fabric in Mexico City, designed by Miss van der Rohe. And I don't know, maybe we stop it. And uh, just to get an idea, there's a prison in, uh, in Argentina. And these are a visit in Lagos. Uh, this is the policeman of the area. And um, he's the, the doctor of the area. And here we are with the um, dancers of Filakuti, Oshi Market, the son of Filakuti, and the Republic of... Uh, and this is a TV station, a Samsonite advertising in Iran, and the Mahakumba Mela, it's the uh, meeting point where every 12 year about 40 million people gather to make the bus in the uh, Ganja, again, a cosmodrome. Maybe 
we, we stop it just that you have an idea there are 300 more so I think we go more to the more actual uh, work because in fact I'm very happy that I have this occasion because again I will try to to use you as a kind of laboratory we began with uh, Anselm and uh, John Palmezino this project for House der Kultur der Welt on Anthropocene and uh, basically began to film three weeks ago. So the material that I will show you is really from the film camera. The assistants are still uh, kind of um, deconverting it. So the audio that you will hear is not so good because it's the audio from the camera. It's not the audio from the sound uh, man, sound uh, designer. And um, maybe uh, you, you want to tell more about um, the spaces? Okay, we just look at it. Yeah. So f before we, yeah. Maybe we can briefly share where, no? Because it's all about yes. spaces. So. About spaces. Uh, maybe. So the first part is uh, filmed at the, um, in Geneva at the World Meteorological Organization. It was on the 27th or 28th of April because there was the opening of the IPCC intergovernmental uh, panel for climate change. So after a long uh, months of um, email exchange, we got the permission to film these 30 minutes of the of the initial part of the of this panel, then we were not allowed. But you will see also, we ask also why we were not allowed, and you will understand that it's, it's a quite complicated diplomatic uh, moment. And we, while we were there, I also, in the, when I was there speaking with the different press officers that were very gentle, I just took some DVDs and copied them in my computer, so I will show you one that I copied. It's from the offic an official DVD from the 2008 of the World Meteorological Organization. I hope the audio works. We can put the audio. Yeah. Weather, climate and water determine people's lives and nations' development. Agriculture, energy, transport, health, tourism, insurance, Virtually all socioeconomic sectors rely on information from national meteorological and hydrological services working together within the World Meteorological Organization. WMO coordinated global observations in the atmosphere, in the oceans, on land and from space serve any individual and humankind as a whole for making the best choices in the light of current and expected weather, climate and water resources. It is essential that we upgrade this observing system to help communities everywhere better plan and prepare for natural hazards and extreme weather. Climate change heightens the vital relevance of observing our planet to preserve our environment and reduce disaster risks. Investing in weather, climate and water observation by the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services is indeed investing in a better future for all. Yes, it's this image. It's again here. I, I found it like this. I didn't edit it. Our planet's weather, climate and water systems are unique. They have defined Earth's ecosystems and shaped human society. While we cannot control these elements, we can understand and predict them. Every day, hundreds of thousands of observations of our planet from space, our atmosphere, the oceans and land provide us with vital data. These observations are crucial, giving us the tools to survive the worst effects of severe weather and adapt to our changing climate. stop because it's another uh, one hour basically and now it begins to be more and more uh, with these uh, archive images this kind of uh, image bank uh, and of course the world meteorological organization also needs needs video because also they need to collect money to uh, found themselves by the different governments so what you see is how 
uh, it's a kind of also their uh, part of their communication. And um, so what we would like to try is, is to see if there is a possibility to, by going there, to, to have another uh, kind of, not using these super spectacular images of storms and uh, disasters, but try to speak uh, uh, there. So what we see now is some images uh, with Mr. Williams, that is the uh, official uh, speaker of the World Meteorological Organization, and you will see some uh, interview, and he was quite gentle, and uh, also we were looking in his computer, I uh, wanted to see what kind of image they use for communi communication, so he showed me some PowerPoints that he had in the computer. I use this program, iMovie, I hope it works. I was just editing today. Play full screen, great. That's our building, very proud of it, of course. This just shows a continuum between now casting, forecasting the weather a few minutes ahead of the thunderstorms coming, all the way out through seasonal forecasting, yearly forecasting, long-term climate change scenarios. This illustrates uh, La Nina and El Nina. This is a good one that we produced based on input from NOAA, NASA, and the UK Met Office. So you see this is global temperatures gradually rising. But natural variability also affects the trend. So the red lines are the warm El Nino years, and the blue lines are the cool La Nina years. So you see how they affect the, the general upward trend. So that's a good graph, I think. It seems often in this institution that PowerPoint is the real language of which communication is, is possible. Somehow, if you don't have, have a PowerPoint, you don't exist. Maybe. Well, this shows you that there's major gaps in observations in the Amazon forest and parts of Africa. So Basically, very dense in Europe. Within the sort of grand narrative that uh, we've been partially puzzling together, um, in fragments today. Um, this is part of a first episode of um, fieldwork into the international architecture of institutions um, that deal today with basically what, we've, what we are calling planning the globe. And it's the history of that is, again, is post-war, post-Second World War. Um, part of the whole sort of redesign of um, world order. Um, and the part of that redesign of that world order was um, concessions made you know, to, by, by what was uh, then most commonly still referred to Western civilization in terms of um, stopping to be outright, outright universalist on the basis of um, values uh, among which uh, racism had ranked very high. Um, moving on that level of humanistic values to a sort of family of man paradigm, the climax of that is the kind of brotherhood and unity uh, program. Uh, uh, and on the level of uh, science, um, uh, a kind of, dis you know, like you could say, universality of science versus uh, an emerging multicultural paradigm. At the same time, the entire globe becomes an object of planning, and there is also a fundamental fantasy at play of being able now to get rid of um, political power as it used to be and replace it with management. Right? This is Buckminster Fuller plays a very big role in there. Um, sort of against the backdrop that, that ideological planning and social engineering had led to disaster, sort of the, the, the cybernetically informed idea that by 
transforming ideology-driven and power-driven political processes into management processes that are based, modeled on self-regulating systems, took over um, and at a, it kind of strangely merged with Cold War uh, uh, war game theory and uh, um, uh, defense uh, research. Now, what we are looking at when we are looking at these institutions, the international architecture of institutions, those institutions that are um, not uh, national, but in somehow funded by international bodies um, uh, or by a number of nation states, is basically um, how science and politics today intertwine and how um, painfully slow these processes are manufactured, how much they rely on protocols, on certain um, a permanent negotiation of little codes and um, that sort of seem to be necessary in order to in, to enwrap and allow um, for ex a, a extremely difficult task such as creating agreement around a set of data so that such an agreement could lead to a policy decision. This is a, these processes are increasingly difficult, increasingly, ever more, because they, at any point in the chain of reference, they could crack, they could be contested, etc. So these institutions and their protocols are also there to make that possible. To, to They're struggling with this idea of... Um, they're part of a kind of interesting link between science, politics, management, and the institutional as such. It came to, to the point that where we, to be able to film, had to ask through the director of the institution, uh, of our institutional world, to ask the ambassador at the UN to present our project. So, in a certain way, to institutionalize the, the artistic project by, by itself. So, oh, oh, sorry. Building, uh, I shouldn't go forth and back because maybe. to look beyond politics and to have the system for sharing uh, data and observations about the weather, about temperature, about rainfall, uh, about wind, and, and so forth. Um, over the years, this has evolved dramatically uh, into a highly sophisticated and technologically advanced system where we now, of course, we rely on the internet. We have uh, numerous satellites uh, gathering data from around the world. We have all sorts of instruments, uh, ocean buoys, that monitor uh, the salinity and the temperature of the ocean. We have obviously thermometers, uh, weather stations on land, we have boats, we have airplanes, we have balloons. There's just thousands and tens of thousands of ways of gathering all sorts of data about the weather and as well as the climate. And uh, again, this has to be shared quickly because uh, it doesn't have value unless it's shared quickly. It has to be shared in common formats. Uh, people take this for granted. They get the weather forecast from their television or from the internet. Uh, and they don't always realize the massive amount of work uh, that goes on behind the scenes to make these weather forecasts possible. Well, uh, climate change, the implications for climate change are enormous in terms of how people live and in terms of economic interests. So if, um, if, if people are convinced that climate change is indeed a big problem and we need to take action, that action will affect the economy and it could affect uh, big parts of the economy, it's positive ways and negative ways. And the ones that are affected negatively, obviously, are not are, are going to defend their interests. Uh, so, and, you know, for government, for government to take action on climate change is it's not just a simple thing. You don't just. It's uh, an example I, I run into is uh, nuclear weapons. If the, the U.S. and Russia want to negotiate an arms agreement, government to government, they can do that. They can agree, and it's very challenging, and there's ideological issues and whatever. But the government to government, they can do that. But climate change, you can't just agree, okay, we're going to reduce our emissions. You have to give incentives to companies, to individuals. You have to change the rules, the taxation, other things in the country. And whenever you start doing that, then you have interests, and, uh, and so naturally these interests uh, respond. This is the part IPCC. Donc, International Panel on Climate Change. Puis, plus loin, nous avons les archives de, de l'information, des services d'information. Et en dernier, les archives de l'hydrologie.
So these were the archives. And um, here we are at the beginning, of the preparation of the IPCC panel. So you see these Arazzo are the four seasons. And uh, yeah, we were kind of not really allowed, but we were standing around, so we filmed a little bit. We said we will test a little bit the cameras, and so we filmed a little bit. about 24 translator involved. a little bit the introduction but the audio now is not the audio that we got from the mixer so uh, we then had also an uh, interview with the spokesman of the IPCC and uh, yeah, we have some more materials this is more the entrance yes. the scientists are having quite um, you know, they're, they're discussing the very latest science a lot of it is it, it's quite sensitive. They might get quite passionate about it. They have they have very lively, passionate discussions among themselves. And if if that was being conducted in public, that discussion, it would inhibit the discussion. People would feel they couldn't be honest and direct and frank. They couldn't criticise each other. And we don't want to inhibit that discussion. We want the discussion to be natural. So some parts of our process. Are, the formal parts are open to the, to the public or open to the media, so we were happy to do that. But in the, the meetings where the scientists really get down to the, to the, the, the detail of the science, we don't, we don't want anything to get in the way of them having a good discussion which will lead to the best possible scientific product. Well. So, here we have uh, Bruno Tour that we interviewed on you know, some of the topic, there is much more. We just now selected uh, an extract to react in a certain way to the institutions. This was filmed in Edinburgh uh, uh, two weeks ago. First, science and politics have always been mixed. It started with Archimedes, and it has never stopped. So it, 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 that's a sort of 19th century potted version of science as separated from politics, which had of course, it's advantages, but which has, of course, never historically been uh, for real. What had an effect at some period in the 19th century was the idea of the separation between the two being useful for protecting the autonomy of, okay. of science, which mainly meant serving the print. Um, so make a the, the break, man. I was just asked to introduce Bruno Latour. Um, now, uh, he's a uh, um, historian of science, he's an uh, anthropologist, philosopher, uh, sociologist, changing his uh, disciplinary affiliations since a while, but he's been very important in this field, uh, emerging field of science studies since the late uh, 1970s um, that sort of uh, turned the scientist's laboratory into an, uh, a place where he would do field work just like, like other uh, anthropologists had done field work wherever, no? in a particular m culture, music, uh, 
culture or whatever, no? like, like basically um, simply trying to, uh, based on fieldwork, trying to understand what is actually going on in um, a laboratory and um, by this occupying that uh, practice of the scientists, trying to dismantle sort of some of the grand claims um, of the architecture or the mythology that surrounds science, sort of their privileged access to um, uh, and, uh, monolithical nature that stands out there and can be observed, etc. Um, that is quite important in relation to uh, this multiplication of agencies, or which is invoked permanently today, um, and for which Latour has found, I think, one of the most powerful sort of samples. It just basically says that nature, for this brief period, um, that we refer to now as modernity was sort of conceived as a stable background. No? It was a background condition of passive stuff upon which active uh, uh, agents called humans would act, extract from its, its laws, etc., imprint their uh, designs and schemes, and also the whole idea of uh, a certain idea of planning. Uh, he says, like, f um, that the Anthropocene or this moment of uh, this blue marble moment, as we could call it, uh, in, in this respect, the turning of the camera here would also mean that this figure-ground relationship between nature and humans as figure, nature as background, humans as figure, has become unstable in the sense that um, this background just doesn't behave as a background anymore. It, and climate change, of course, is the kind of classic example there, no? like suddenly you have all kind of actors such as a gas in the atmosphere um, uh, entering the, f the, the field of agents and therefore of politics. Um, so basically um, that is the, uh, maybe by way of an introduction, what he talks about is, is, is pretty daring because he inscribed, he basically says that this nature concept in these five lectures, he, he says that this nature concept that modern science used to deal with sort of is a theological uh, conception. I'm not going to go into details there. It's, it's quite daring and interesting. Um, and he moves on to a concept that I would wa briefly want to mention because it's very important. It's entered the stage also the public the, the non-specialist public for the first time through Stuart Brown's publishing, not the whole Earth Catalog, but a magazine that he published in the 70s called Co-Evolution Quarterly, which um, was mainly driven by the ideas of Gregory Bateson, who's written the in book uh, Ecology of the Mind, also very important uh, for our discussion. And in 19, 1975, Co-Evolution Quarterly for the first time publishes um, James Lovelock and Lynn Margillis on the subject of Gaia theory. Now, Gaia theory is, in a way, um, uh, the, uh, it, highly controversial, because, particularly because of its sort of esoteric uh, connotations, mainly induced by its name, the, the Greek goddess uh, Gaia. Um, basically says that the entire planet, or at least the um, uh, surface plus the deep surface, in the sense of the, uh, the living part of the planet, is an organism. Um, now, that, of course, in its problematic part is uh, that it inscribes everything into sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a brutal gesture of making us all, of enclosing us in an in, in the interior of an organism where, um, where sort of the idea of uh, self-regulation um, that Lovelock has actually put forward in the sense of the, the archi that life itself maintains its conditions through regulating the gases of the atmosphere. There is, he, Latour gives this Gaia concept, it's sort of anti-holistic twist or tries to position Gaia as actually one of the, the most secular possible way to look at the planet, which I find quite um, uh, an interesting proposal. I, I think we don't have time to go into details of it, but we should listen. Maybe that was giving you some keys of what, what Bruno Latour in this few minutes that we've selected here is talking about. We'll, we'll, 
we'll do we we do the few minutes. That's a sort of 19th century potted version of science and separated from politics, which had, of course, its advantages, but which has, of course, never historically been uh, or, 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 or real. What had an effect at some period in the 19th century was the idea of the separation between the two being useful for protecting the autonomy of, of science, which mainly meant serving the queen. So, uh, uh, Autonomy is, is a very debate, debatable term, and it never uh, works. I think what, what is new is what I mentioned before, which is that, uh, see, lots of those sciences before, when we talk about physics, even molecular biology, even health, actually, were science of a laboratory. So they were actually, it, made, it had a sense to say, okay, let us protect the space in which we work, and then you will see if there are output which you like, and then we, we will use this trope of a uh, science proposed and society disposed and decide. And of course it was never this way. We have shown that myself, a mini example, but lots of historians think this was rubbish. Still, it had a sort of, on the face of it, sort of plausibility. Hello? Yeah, we leave this here, just as a, um, and, sh and show you a last clip. Um. So, uh, this is uh, Will Steffen, that is uh, uh, one of the most important uh, researchers about atmospheric changes, together with uh, Krutzen. And um, he's the one that in a certain way developed this, this, this concept of tipping point. So he says that in a certain way, the climate change is, I mean, it's, the temperature is not only rising, uh, but we, na uh, we are now reached a, a, a moment where the rising of temperature is, is exponential. exponential. And uh, well, he's trying to, to explain it uh, to us. He's also part of this uh, commission, uh, that uh, geological commission in London, that will decide uh, by the year 2016 if we are in the Holocene or if in a certain way we change so much the, it's a geological commission, if we change so much the earth surface and you would consider the atmosphere part of the surface, that it's uh, irreversible and so in a certain way we are in the Anthropocene. So there is a, this commission that is also in a certain way self-organized, we are also thinking uh, for the film to invite them uh, to bring them together because in fact they don't have the money to uh, to pay for their flights so we hope to not only to create a documentary but maybe to activate also the decisions in a certain way uh, temperature goes up and that's what i used as my parameter there or my indicator as that goes up um, you can think of how is that going to develop in the future and if you look at the ipcc uh, models, the, the models that are assessed in the IPCC, what you find is that when you go up to 2100 you get a whole range. You can go anywhere from, say, a degree or a degree and a half above the late 20th century average to all the way up to about six degrees, and everything in between. I was trying to show the complex system science, say, that's actually not how complex systems operate. You don't get anything, everything in between. You either stay below a tipping point, at which point um, the system may be pushed, but if you don't push it any further, it will eventually relax down to the state that you knew. Or if you go across that point, feedback mechanisms kick in that push it all the way up to another state. And it, it splits. In the technical terms, it bifurcates. You simply don't see a spectrum in between. You see it relaxing back down to the state it was in, or you see it going up. Think of it this way. Here's a simple analogy. I go out on the on the river here, the spray, and I'm in a kayak, kayaking down the spray, um, and I tip it a bit. It comes back. Okay. It doesn't stay tipped because it has a mechanism to recycle itself. And I tip it a bit more, it comes back. And if I tip it just a little bit more, I go completely under. Okay. 
So that's a system. That kayak and myself are form a system that have two stable states. Upright paddling and upside down with my head in water. Nothing in between. Going halfway down and lying on the water is not a stable state. It'll either pop up or it'll go down. So that's typical of a complex system. And so all the point I was trying to make is the climate may very well act like that. Right now we're tipping it. And this two degree guardrail you hear people talk about, that could be like your canoe going over, but still it comes back. Okay. So we stopped the warming at two degrees by 2100, and by 2300 it's dropping back down toward the holes. I think if you go four degrees or more, you're underwater. The canoe's not going to come back up. Where that point is between the canoe popping up and the canoe going into water, I think it's somewhere between two and four, but I don't know where it is between them. That's going to require some more work, and we may never know precisely. So that's, that's the analogy. Now, just think for a second of the, the body that feels the earthquakes. Um, I, I'd like to think of that as well as sort of part of the pathos of the Anthropocene, of him becoming the graph. No? Like, it's very interesting what he's actually doing there when he's acting, when he's gesturing this out. I mean, both the last two clips are very strongly gestural, and part of that is exactly how do you um, how do you become the medium of that agencies of which you are to become the spokesperson. You speak for the climate. You speak on behalf of, right? And that's uh, in in the case of him, of Stefan. I think it's incredibly interesting to see how he actually acts with the, how he almost acts out an old ecological paradigm, namely the idea of the balance of nature, which... No, it's a meta <laughs> um, So, yeah, anyway, um, just as a last... <laughs> no, there is also the, the balance of the, the human body in set in relation to... Um, okay, um, I think... Up to here, I'd like to um, basically, I think we have all the participants of the day here in front lines. I'm not sure if we should assemble on stage or if we should just take questions immediately as they are on your lips. And then gradually you could move up to stage. Do we have enough chairs to assemble?